Financial Services versus Nona Tobin. Good morning, Your Honor. This is Suzanne Carver, bar number 14689 on behalf of Nona Tobin. I, was, I would request that you hear our motion to withdraw on an OST basis as there was no oppositions filed and Ms. Tobin filed the declaration in support of that on November 14th. Good morning, Mr. Scow. I can see you. Any objection to me dealing with any objection to me dealing with the motion to withdraw first? No, Your Honor. Good, um, good, good morning, Your Honor. I just wanted to make my appearance. Lilith Zara, bar number 13138, on behalf of Nation Star and Wells Fargo. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Zara. All right. Any objection, Ms. Zara, to me dealing with the motion to withdraw first? No, Your Honor. All right. Um, okay. There was no opposition to this. Ms. Tobin is in agreement that she wants to represent herself in pro per. Ms. Carver, your motion will be granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I submit a motion, uh, an order to you directly? Yes, you may to my OIC and I'll sign off on it. Thank you. And then also, Your Honor, I believe Ms. Tobin needs to have more than 15 minutes to discuss the motion to reconsider that is on calendar for this morning. Well, I just granted your motion to withdraw, so guess what, Ms. Carver? Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, she, she can make that representation herself. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, this is Nona Tobin's motion for reconsideration of the order that was filed on September 10th, 2021. Um, the court has read and reviewed the motion for reconsideration. Um, Ms. Tobin, you have 15 minutes to argue, or I can continue this. Um, can I Ms. Tobin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, thank you. I, I would like um, to continue it until um, uh, the uh, there's a hearing scheduled, I think, on the four, uh, 16th of um, December regarding um, Nation Star's um, motion to strike my um, motion, uh, my uh, notice of three-day uh, three notice of intent to take their default. And um, the issue here with the um, uh, motion for reconsideration is that it, I would like to have leave to amend it to include the um, grounds of fraud on the court, Rule 60D. My um, issue with the um, September 10th order is that the um, the court decided to grant Red Rock's um, motion to dismiss with prejudice without holding the evidentiary hearing that was ordered for that day on um, August 19th. Ms. The, um, Ms. Tobin, yes. Ms. Tobin, there was no evidentiary hearing ordered. What the court did is the court looked at all of the notebooks that had been submitted and thought it was going to need an evidentiary hearing. The court, after reviewing the briefing, decided it didn't need an evidentiary hearing. That is up to me to decide, and I can make that decision. So if I don't feel that I need an evidentiary hearing to decide the issues, I don't have to hold an evidentiary hearing. And that's exactly what the court did. And no, no, the court as far as your as far as your motion for reconsideration, again, I have reviewed it. Um, your oral motion this morning to um, amend your motion for reconsideration to add arguments regarding the fraud upon the court is denied. Um, and I would also note in going back and looking at the um, order that I did and Mr. Scow, I would like you or actually Ms. Zara, I'd like you to submit um, an additional order to this court. I noted in the motion itself that there had been a joinder filed, but when I did the actual order at the end, 
the court noted that I didn't grant the joinder, um, and I should have done that. So I am sua sponte ordering Ms. Zara to please submit an order granting their joinder, which would then, um, in effect, Ms. Tobin, make your uh, make the motion um, to strike the three-day notice of intent to default moot because you have no basis for the default because your counterclaims have been dismissed. So um, if you would like additional time to argue your motion for reconsideration, I can do that. I can move everything to the 16th, um, but it's it's not because of the fact that there's going to be the motion to strike because that motion to strike is essentially going to be moot. Um, so that's where we're at at this juncture. Your Honor, um, you granted their motion to dismiss with prejudice and now I have added the joinder um, to dismiss with prejudice uh, the claims against the Nation Star and Wells Fargo. Yes, I have. And um, I would like the court to consider that the grounds um, that you used, claims preclusion, um, time barred, and um, what was the other one? Um, not properly pled according to the um, Rule 9B standard. I know what I, I would like to suggest that had you had the evidentiary hearing that was ordered originally um, and was scheduled, and I got, I hired an attorney to handle, you would have known that claims preclusion did not apply actually because Miss Tobin, the first Miss Tobin. Yes, do you want 15 minutes to argue your motion today, or do you want to reschedule it? I'll, I'll argue it right now. All right. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay. The, the motion for um, dismissal was based on my um, on claims preclusion. And my argument is claims preclusion does not apply, first, because the claims are different, the parties are different, and because there was not a full and fair opportunity to litigate in the original um, proceedings. In the original proceedings, there were um, uh, Nation Star met with the attorney, Nation Star's attorney, Melanie Morgan and um, the attorney for um, Jimmy Jack, Joseph Hong, met ex parte with Judge Kishner and pretty much decided the case on their own after serving me notice that this um, hearing on April 23rd of 19 would not be held. And so my attorney and I did not appear. So at that hearing, the, they decided that I had never been a party in the case and um, so that all my pro se uh, filings, including um, counter motions for summary judgment and uh, that sort of thing, um, were, were stricken from the record. Um, so I was not able to appeal that because the court just decided that I was not a party. Okay, so in that first um, proceedings, the um, Red Rock and Sun City Anthem had supplied false evidence, falsified records um, to the court to support a motion for summary judgment, a partial motion for summary judgment against the um, quiet title claim of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. And they did not um, consider me as an individual a party and then I could not appeal it. So I filed, I attempted everything I could within that um, first case to um, get myself back in as a party, get my claims heard, but I was denied. And then I was forced to file the second case. So I filed the second case and it included um, 
the quiet title of equitable relief, the unjust enrichment for Red Rock not um, paying out the um, excess funds as required, and it also included an abuse of process claim against the attorneys in the first action. Now, when that, uh, when I hired an attorney to take the case over, um, he just said, just um, bifurcate the case so that you're just addressing the issue of quiet title and getting the um, excess proceeds of the sale. And so, that's what I did. So the abuse of process and the complaint against the attorneys for the ex parte meeting with the judge and for um, basically lying to the court, um, that was set aside for a future time. So that second proceedings, Red Rock um, filed this un completely unwarranted motion to dismiss on the grounds of claims preclusion when in fact the <sighs> The claims were um, not the same. They were not previously adjudicated. And um, Red Rock still had not distributed the proceeds of the, the sale. And the, the other issue is that I filed claims against NationStar in the second proceedings when I, I had not in the first because I intended to join NationStar in the first proceedings to void the sale and then Nation Star and I would be returned to our respective positions the day before the sale, as if the defective sale had never occurred. And Nation Star then would have to um, uh, comply with the standards of uh, Chapter 107 and, as amended by AB 284 to, uh, 2011, which was um, Nevada's anti foreclosure fraud law, in order to foreclose on me which they couldn't. And so um, that's uh, why I um, had complaint against uh, NationStar in the second, in addition to their fraud on the court in the first. Um, so now we come to this third action, which I did not file. I was a defendant. And Nation, um, Red Rock filed this seven years after I had made two attempts in civil court and two attempts in um, informally or directly to get those uh, excess proceeds because I am the only claimant. Um, Nation Star and Wells Fargo have no, no status. They are judicially stopped from um, claiming to be owed a debt from the Hanson um, July 22nd of four um, first deed of trust and from their uh, Nation Stars repeated conflicting lies about how they acquired their interest and they don't actually have any interest. And so if the court had had um, the evidentiary hearing that I need and that really is what, uh, is, what is necessary to achieve a, a fair result, then the, the court would have seen that um, the facts of the situation are that Red Rock um, conducted a fraudulent sale without notice. And then they, in court, they, they gave to uh, Sun City Anthem a fraudulent foreclosure for, file, and they provided the same thing to me in uh, response to subpoena. False evidence entered into the court record and then they, um, you know, so they were basically, they did a fraudulent sale and then they lied to the court about it to cover it up. Nation Star, Nation Star had no standing to file their quiet title claim because they were lying about being the beneficiary of the Hanson Deed of Trust that was extinguished by the, by the um, August uh, 15, 2014 HOA sale. Nation Star was the proximate cause of that sale. I sold that property four times, and um, the servicing banks obstructed the sale. These were arm's length, uh, fair market value sale. And then Nation Star let Red Rock foreclose on it without Nation Star ever having filed a notice of default on the um, Hanson Deed of Trust when payments stopped uh, when the borrower died. Now, they're saying, 
Nation Star is saying that they um, get to uh, have the, uh, the like the, the, they're saying that the sale was um, valid to extinguish my rights, the owner's rights, the beneficiary's rights, but we're, we're not valid uh, to extinguish Nation Star's rights because Bank of America's agent, Miles Bauer, um, turned uh, over to um, Red Rock uh, the super priority amount and Red Rock, without any legal authority, rejected that assessment, those assessment payments. And I'm saying that Nation Star also um, put in um, a super priority payment, which they concealed and they never used. Um, but Nation Star put that in in order to close the sale that I made to um, uh, MK, MZK Properties on May 8th of 14 for $367,000 on an auction.com sale that Nation Star would not let escrow close on. And so Nation Star conceals all these material facts about what actually happened, as did Red Rock. Red Rock unfairly rejected three assessment payments that were, would have cured a default and then proceeded to without notice foreclose on that property. And um, so your honor, like I am in a situation where the court is making these decisions based on the misrepresentations of opposing counsel and not by looking at the evidence. And this is the third court that has done that as making decisions because um, legal counsel says something's true, but not ever checking the evidence. Now, there is also um, the fact that in the first proceedings, there was no adjudication of Nation Star's quiet title claim. Nation Star dismissed their um, quiet title claims without going to trial. And Nation Star and Jimmy Jack made a side deal without including me as a mandatory um, necessary party under Rule 19. And they made a side deal. And they told um, Judge Kishner in the first case that this was the Jimmy Jack Nation Star uh, side deal that settled all quiet title claims. Well, it didn't settle my quiet title claim. I was there, and I, and they just got the court to say I was not there, that I was not a party. But I was a necessary party under Rule 19. I have a deed from 2017. In I closed the Hanson Trust when it was insolvent in 2017, and um, everything that these opposing counsels are doing to suppress the evidence and to prevent, have, has prevented a fair adjudication of my claims. And I feel that um, the fraud on the court is something that needs to be considered. Now, this court says that the motion to dismiss was a responsive pleading, and therefore the um, uh, my notice of intent to take default against uh, uh, the banks was was uh, not valid. But but a motion to dismiss first it was a joinder they did not their own motion included a lot of, of misrepresentations, and that uh, motion to dismiss is not a responsive pleading under Rule 15. Rule 15 says that I should have an opportunity to um, amend according to, you know, if there is um, uh, a motion to dismiss, I should have an opportunity to amend in the course and scope one time Ms. in the ordinary course. Ms. Tobin, Ms. Tobin, Ms. Tobin, Rule yes. 15 only applies if the court grants leave to amend. The court did not grant leave to amend because it found that it would be futile because these claims are barred by claim preclusion. And your remedy in the other, you know, you keep on bringing up this first case and the second case and the court takes high offense to your allegation that this court has not looked at the evidence. You submitted numerous, numerous binders. And if there's one thing that everybody knows when they come into this court, this court reviews evidence. This court looks at everything that is submitted to it and reviews it, which is the reason why 
after reviewing everything that the court did not feel that it was necessary to hold an evidentiary hearing because these claims are barred by claim preclusion. And if you, if you felt that the decision in the first case was wrong, then your remedy in that case was to file an action on behalf of the Gordon B. Hanson Trust as the trustee of the Gordon B. Hanson Trust and appeal that decision. Your remedy is not to continuously file complaints in different courts and attempt to get different answers. So the reason that the court did not, you don't get relief under Rule 15, and Rule 12 provides so that if you are going to, you have to file either an answer or a motion okay, to dismiss. Want, they filed a motion to dismiss. Mr. Bellinger, no, I mean, please put you yourself on mute. They filed a motion to dismiss and the court did not grant leave to amend, so you don't get relief under Rule 15. So I wanted to explain that to you. You have three minutes to continue to finish up your argument. Your Honor, my argument is that claims preclusion does not apply when there was not a full and fair opportunity to litigate in the first case. And that the claims are different. In the first case, it was dealing with the issue of the fraudulent nature and of the sale. And in this case, I did not file this in a different court. I was sued. And under Rule 13, there are compulsory counterclaims which have to be made when you're sued. And so I did make those counterclaims. And those counterclaims were referring to the fraud on the court of Red Rock for putting in false evidence. So the court's orders were erroneous because they were not based on verified evidence. Now, you looked at the binders that I provided. And one of the things describes the ex parte meeting with Judge Kishner, which is just unbelievable to me that that is found acceptable. It is not acceptable. And it derailed my case entirely to such an extent that I was not able to appeal or present my rights as an individual in the first case. Now, if you looked at that evidence, you will know that Nation Star is judicially stopped from claiming to be owed a debt because they repeatedly changed their story about how they acquired this interest. And I can prove, if the court looks at verified evidence, I can prove that Nation Star did not have any standing and does not in this case. Nation Star and Wells Fargo did not file a claim for those proceeds. Okay. And if they didn't, that's why Mr. Scow and why Red Rock has filed an interpleader action. I think that you misunderstand, Ms. Tobin, what an interpleader action is. An interpleader action in its very simplest form is we're holding on to money and we don't know who it belongs to. So court, please bring the parties in and make an adjudication as to who this money belongs to. So to the extent that you're arguing that Wells Fargo and Nation Star are judicially stopped from making a claim to these proceeds, you may be right. But it doesn't give you a right. You're not holding on to funds from them. So just on that basis alone, your counterclaim for interpleader is improper. You're not holding any money for anybody. But they're holding money. This claim is not, their complaint is only for interpleader to say, court, please tell us who we give this money to. That is staying alive. The only thing that the court has done is it has dismissed your counterclaims on the basis that they are precluded. And 
The court took a very long time in making that decision. It went back, it reviewed everything. There has been nothing new that has been presented. The arguments contained in the motion for reconsideration are the same. Therefore, on that basis, your motion for reconsideration is denied. However, the interpleader action remains viable and you can certainly come in here and argue that you are 100% entitled to those fees or to the money, the excess proceeds from the foreclosure sale. And if your argument is Nation Star and Wells Fargo don't have any right to those fees, you can still make that argument that you should get all of the excess proceeds. So that's the, right. court, that's the court's decision. Mr. Scow, will you please prepare the order? You're on mute, Mr. Scow. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you, Honor. We'll prepare an order and run it by everybody before we submit it to you. Okay. Um, all right. Your um, Honor. Yes. Your Honor. My name is Robert Bettinger, and I'm from Desert Ridge Legal Group, and I'm stepping in for Thomas Laramore on the Angelica Shepherd case. That's versus Kelsey Avery. I haven't called it yet, Mr. Bettinger. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Your Honor. Your Honor, this is uh, Lois uh, Zara from Ackerman on behalf of Wells Fargo and um, Nation Star. I just wanted to clarify on that order to um, uh, clarify that the joinder was um, granted with the um, original um, order that didn't include it. Um, do you want a full order with all of the same stuff in it, or can it refer to the um, prior order? and grant with joinder that way? You can refer to the prior order and grant it that way. It was literally, I just noticed it the other day when I was preparing for this case that it was an oversight on my part and I should have I should have granted the joinder. So, um, but Understood. I do want you to, because it does moot out the motion to strike because the counterclaims of your joinder was granted, so it moots the motion to strike the notice of intent to take default. Um, can you include that language as well? Your Honor? I will, Your Honor. Um, could I yes. circulate that, or is that then directly to the court? No, if you could circulate that, and then um, I want it to be clear, Mr. Scow, in your order from today, that the, um, the issue as to um, Nation Star and Wells Fargo's right to these proceeds is, you know, just by dismissing. I basically wanted to be clear that simply by dismissing the counterclaims, it doesn't mean that and granting their joinder um, that it is a done duty, that the interpleader is still open as to all the parties and everybody will get to argue their, their arguments on who's rightful to the funds. Does that make sense? It, it does, Your Honor, and we'll make okay. that clear that the yeah. interpleader is still remaining. Okay, if you could just make it a little bit more eloquent than what I just stated, <laughs> I'd appreciate it. No, no, that was fine, but <laughs> you got it. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, this is Nona Tobin. May I request that um, my motion for the distribution of the proceeds be considered? Uh, that is part of what the interpleader complaint is about. And so as it pertains to that, Ms. Tobin, um, I'll need you to file. Uh, has there already been? Well, let me ask this question because I don't know. I just know what's in front of me as far as that motion to strike and, and what was on for today. Is there already a motion in place for... Um, distribution, Mr. Scow, on that? No, there's not, Your Honor. There was... Yes, a, there is, Your um, Honor. And, and, Your Honor, there there was a motion that, that Ms. Tobin filed. It actually had some conflicting uh, issues there and was opposed. That was part of all of the hearings that Your Honor heard on, on September 10th. Okay. Uh, I, I think it would it would behoove everyone if, if Ms. Tobin wants to, to file such an a motion. She should probably refile it. Um, I think with the the thought in mind that it can be narrower as to what her request is, so that there aren't 
the other types of allegations that were problematic. All right, Ms. Tobin, so to the extent yeah. that all of your counterclaims are gone away, as I explained, there's still this interpleader and the excess funds. So I need you to file a motion for, and it's gonna be exactly this, a motion for distribution of the excess proceeds and please list in there the basis, your legal basis, as to why you are entitled to that, that those proceeds and nobody else that's contained in this complaint is entitled to those proceeds. So you'll need to make arguments as to why the Gordon B. Hansen Trust is not entitled to it, why Nation Star Mortgage is not entitled to it, while, why Wells Fargo is not entitled to it, and then Nation Star Wells Fargo um, will have an opportunity, since you are the trustee of the trust, um, and nobody else is representing the, the trust, and I understand that it's been dissolved at this point, but you still need to make that argument. And then the other side will have their opportunity to file any opposition that they may file. They may agree with you, and if they do, then this case will be done. Um, I would hope, Mr. Scow, that um, now that Ms. Tobin is not, you know, now that she's not represented by counsel, she's representing herself, if maybe there's a way that you guys could get this to a settlement conference and resolve this issue, um, that would be beneficial to everybody. But um, if you can't do that, then I will certainly um, hear the motion. And it sounds like from her argument, and I don't know if this is the case, Ms. Zara, that neither Nation Star nor Wells Fargo have any interest in these funds um, and so, you know, the only other person that I see on here is Republic Services, but I don't know where their standing is on this as well. So um, that'll be the court's ruling for today. The, the order on your excess funds, because the request for the motion hearing on that, Ms. Tobin, to the extent that it was wrapped up with other stuff, that's not before the court today, so I need you to refile that, okay? Okay, thank you. All right. All right, do Thank everybody you, understand where we're at and what the court's rulings was? Do we need any clarification? No, that's right. fine. No, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Scow, I know that no, you asked for attorney's fees under ADCR 18010. I'm going to deny those for today, okay? That's fine, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Your Honor. Page 17.